Full disclosure. This chapter in the book of Timothy is one of the most controversial chapters in the entire book of the Bible. Um, I'm going to teach this how I believe God has spoken it to me and how I interpret what Paul is trying to communicate and the heart behind what Paul is trying to communicate here to Timothy as it relates to men and women, older men and younger men, older women, younger women, and their role in the church. Um, all that to say, if it sounds like I'm dancing around or tiptoeing, it's because I am, and I would rather be upfront about that, but I want to be super careful how I word this. Um, I will say two things regarding this book of the Bible. Number one, if you have an issue with this book of the Bible and this chapter of the Bible and what God's word is, you need to check your heart because God's word is true and there is nothing in God's word that's a lie. Second, if you disagree with my interpretation, that's 100% okay. Okay. You are free to disagree. There are many churches and many denominations that do. And you might say, well, how can, how, can, how can we be friends if we don't agree with each other about something with doctrine? Oh, no. I think it'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. The scripture says that we see through a glass dimly. And there are some things that, honestly, Christ will have to settle for us one day. And there's a good chance that maybe we all see it wrong. I would remind you of this story that took place with the children of Israel when they went to the promised land. Joshua takes them across the Jordan River and they come to the angel of the Lord. It's a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. And he goes, whose side are you on? Are you on our side or are you on our enemies? And the angel of the Lord looks at him and he goes, neither. He goes, I'm on the Lord's side. And I've always loved that passage because it always reminds me whether it be a political debate, a religious debate, or what have you, a debate that always ends up without consensus, there's going to be times where we're not going to see eye to eye, and that's okay. My heart, though, is not that I would see eye to eye with you. My heart, that is, I would see eye to eye with the Lord. Ephesians 1, praying that God would open up the eyes of my understanding, that they might be enlightened, that I would understand His heart as it relates to a situation. And all this to say, Paul talks about some things that might not be politically correct in our current culture, but that doesn't make them incorrect because I will tell you this, I would rather my life be biblically correct than politically correct, and I believe that you believe that as well. Let's dive into 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's see what Paul has to say to the church and to Timothy, a young pastor. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. He says, listen, I urge you, I'm telling you, Timothy, I want you to pray. I want you to intercede. I want you to be thankful for all people. I want you to love everyone. We, I, I want you to love all, always. He sets the bar. I, I mean, he just sets the bar. He says, I want you to love everyone. I want you to pray for everyone. I want you to believe for everyone. This is what I want. But then he says something that doesn't always sit well with me. He says, for kings and all those in authority. Well, what if I don't feel like it, Paul? What if I don't, what if I didn't vote for the governor? What if I didn't vote for the president? What if it wasn't my choice? What if it's not my preference? What if, what if I wanted something different? And it's a convicting scripture because Paul says, I want you to pray for all of those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Well, well, what if I don't want to be peaceful? What if, what if my flesh isn't happy with what's going on? And that's when I begin to introspectively look into my heart and pray and say, you know what, maybe it just is my flesh. Maybe my flesh is upset because it didn't get its way. Maybe my flesh is upset because there are people who aren't doing things God's way. And you know what? There are going to be people who aren't going to do things God's way. But I know this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we don't fight for victory. We fight from a place of victory. Christ has already won at the cross. And if there's one thing that life has taught me, there's the scripture, and I've talked about this before, that I, I'm learning it more and more every day, and I don't fully understand it. But it says that he works all things to the counsel of his own will. What does that mean? I don't know. 
but I know that it's true, and I know that he's working things together for the good. Romans tells us that he works all things together for the good, for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So I don't always know what the counsel of his will is, but I know the counsel of his will is good because he told me that it is. And if that means that I need to pray for a leader, even if I don't like them, I need to humble myself and believe for them. And watch this, because this is good. Number three, verse three. He says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, I always look in the scripture for unnecessary details because that's when God's often making his point. In verse four appears to be an unnecessary statement. He could have just said, this is good and pleases God our Savior. He could have said, pray for leaders, pray for those in authority, and this is good, it pleases God. But he went on to say, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Maybe my praying for them has nothing to do with my situation changing in the natural. Maybe it has everything to do with their situation eternally changing and God wanting to do a work in their life and God wanting to save their soul. Maybe me praying for my leaders has nothing to do with me and everything to do with them. And sometimes my flesh doesn't feel like it, but God says this is good and it's pleasing to me. Verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. He says there's one mediator, one God. It's Jesus Christ. There's one way to the Father. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and apostle. For this purpose, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I was, I was called to be an apostle. By the command of God, we learned in chapter one, he said, I'm telling you the truth. I am not lying. Timothy, he doubles down. He says, I'm telling you the truth. There's no lie in my heart. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. He says, Timothy, I'm telling you. You need to be praying for leaders. You need to be praying for those in authority. You need to be believing for all people. You need to be believing that God would move on the hearts of people. Timothy, I'm telling you, verse 8. This is when he gets into the instruction of men and women in the church. Verse 8. I want you to catch this. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. In this context, he is speaking to primarily the older men in the church because he talks about the younger men later, but it's important. He says, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger, disputing. Okay, what does that look like? God, you want me to pray and you want me to lift up my hands. What is lifting up my hands in the scripture? It's a sign of surrender. God, you want me to say that I'm surrendered to your will. God, I'm surrendered to your way. God, I can't, but you can. And then he says something cool. He says, without anger or disputing, he says, we don't need to be fighting each other. We don't need to be fighting each other about who knows best because we both know who knows best. God knows best. We need to lift our hands to the Lord. And if we're in agreement that God is the only way and we're believing and we're praying, when we come together, when two or more come together in his name, he's there. That's when true breakthrough begins to take place. Not when we try to do it ourselves, but when we leave it, when we cast our cares on him for he cares for us, Peter would tell us. And then in Hebrews, it tells us that we can come boldly to his throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need. Why? Because he cares about the things that are going on in our life. Then he begins to speak to the women. He says, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Okay, I wanna explain this and how I interpret this. He said, I also want the women to dress modestly. Okay. When he says modestly, he's talking about, that would be the, what's this word? Antonym. That would be the antonym to loosely or provocatively. He doesn't want the women in the church to be dressing in a way that could lead others to stumble or lead others to deal with lust. He wants us to dress in a way that's modest. He's not saying that you can't wear nice clothes. But what he's saying is, and I'm going to word this the best way I can, that um, it doesn't always have to be super skin tight, not, and things don't always need to be uh, out for the whole world to see. That's the nicest way that I can say it. He says we can dress modestly, we can dress appropriately, we can dress in a way that we don't become a stumbling block for others. And there's this 
there's this thing that goes throughout our culture that says, well, it's my body and I can dress however I want. You can. You can dress however you want. That's not wrong. But God asks you, God asks me to dress modestly. God asks us to not be a stumbling block for others. God asks us to consider others greater than ourselves or to consider others less because we could also fall and we could also be tempted. When he talks about restoring others in a spirit of gentleness in another part of the scripture, he talks about considering others in the way that we live. To have decency and propriety adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Is he saying that you can't wear jewelry or makeup or anything? I don't believe that. I have no problem. My, my wife wears jewelry. My wife wears makeup. My, my wife likes to wear a nice dress. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I believe Paul's trying to communicate is if it's all about the outward appearance, then you missed what impresses God. You're looking for the praise of man. And the scripture talks about how people who are looking for human praise rather than godly praise. And he says something so cool, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. He says, listen, he says, ladies, God looks at the heart. Jesus would communicate this. He would word it differently. Paul's just repackaging what Jesus said. God looks at the heart. God looks at the inward. He's not concerned about the outward. God made the outward. He, he, he already knows that you're beautiful. He made you. But God's looking at your heart, and he wants to see your heart of gold. He's not as concerned about your earrings of gold. He cares about your heart of gold. I believe that's the heart of what Paul is communicating. Then in verse 11, Here's where we get the ones that can get a little testy. He gives this statement, and then he gives two examples in the scripture. I want to read it, and then I want to break it down and explain it and what I believe God is speaking to us. Verse 11, he says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. He said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. I want to come back to verse 12, and I want to teach it in the King James in a minute. I I personally do not like the word choice the NIV used translating from Greek to English. I believe it misses something in translation. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner or a transgressor. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, I want to go to verse 11 and I want to break this down sentence by sentence. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission or, or or he would speak to the women that they need to not be speaking in church or they need to be honoring of the setting. And I want to be honest about the culture at that time. Unfortunately, and we've made great advancements throughout the year, in that culture, women often were not educated to the same level that men were. There were times where women might not be able to read. Women... Um, were not educated in school at the same level. And so then when they would get into church and they would have discussion, there would be situations where women might not understand everything because they had not been properly taught or educated. And what would take place was there were situations where there were um, interruptions. And a lot of theologians believe that Paul was basically saying, hey, if your wife doesn't understand the scripture like you do because you were raised and educated, she needs to wait till you get home and you two can talk about it together so that she doesn't interrupt the service or the conversation that's taking place. That is what many theologians believe the heart behind what Paul was communicating to Timothy in the context of that letter. I personally agree with that. I don't believe that the heart of what he was saying was women should never speak. I, I don't agree with that. I think what he was communicating in the context of this letter is that we need to learn, and we really, we all need to learn with a, with a humble heart and with a submissive spirit and with quietness. The scripture says we all need to be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to anchor. I don't believe what he's saying is, is offensive. Now, people may be offended by it, but I would say this. It's the, it's the scripture. Verse 12. He said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. The King James Version says, or to usurp authority over a man. I really don't like the word assume. It's not the best translation from Greek to English. I believe usurp is a better one because when you dive into your dictionary, you begin to study the words. Usurp means to take illegally or to take by force. And what Paul was saying is, I do not permit a woman to take 
illegally or to take by force authority over a man. He's saying, I don't want her to take something or to go outside of the established order. God's created a structure. Are men and women equal? Yes. God created them male and female in the image and the likeness of God. He created them. Genesis 1, this is the basics. Men and women are equal. But we each have different positions. He would even talk about childbearing. The women are are the mother, the husband is the father, and the wife will have the children and the husband will be the father. It's really simple. We have different structure. The husband is called to be the spiritual authority of the home. It doesn't mean that he lords or domineers over his home. It means that he serves. Ephesians 5, if you want to go, go watch that video and learn about what Paul would communicate to the church at Ephesus. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, willing to lay down your life for her. You treat her like Jesus treated you, he would say to the man. And then to the woman, he would say, um, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. You honor him like you honor the Lord. If you both honor each other and treat each other as Jesus treated you, then you'll be a-okay. It's when we get out of order that we start to have issues. And he gives this example. He gives two examples. Number one is verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was formed in the garden, and a rib was taken out of Adam, and Eve was formed. She was made to, she's called a helpmeet, or to complete him. God brought a man and a woman together so that they could be complete in his image and his likeness. And it's a beautiful picture, but inside of that, he was made first, and therefore he was called to lead. It's, it's not anything unhealthy. It's not anything appropriate, inappropriate. It's a, it's a picture of spiritual order. Then in verse 14, he says, And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, I want to give my opinion about this scripture because this is a really unique scripture because a lot of people read this and think that he's just slamming Eve. In the reality, he's also taking a shot at Adam because they both sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says in the scripture that Eve was deceived and that Adam wasn't. Well, what does that mean? It means that Adam was just straight up rebellious. Adam knew what he was doing was wrong and he did it anyways. Eve was deceived. And I, I almost laugh because basically in this context, Paul's stereotyping and there's a lot of truth to it because it, here's the reality. Do we all make stupid decisions? Yes. But more often than not, guys know what they're doing is wrong and they do it anyways. My wife would be the first to tell me. She goes, did you, did you know what I asked you to do? Well, yes. Well, did you do it? Well, no. Well, why not? Well, 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 and that's the life of being a guy. Like sometimes we just do dumb stuff. But he talks about the woman and talks about how she's more likely to be deceived. The enemy, the enemy likes to poke males in the area of pride more often than not to get us to rile up and to rebel and to do what we want to do. With women, he's often more cunning. He's often more sneaky and he will deceive them through the area of compassion or he will try to get them to compromise their convictions based off of emotion. One of the big things we teach in um, freedom is something, it was one of the small groups I'm really passionate about. We use this phrase that choices lead, feelings follow. And what the enemy tries to get us to do is to make choices based off of our feelings, but we really need to make choices based off of the word. And what Paul is basically warning is he says he, the ladies need to be careful because the enemy will try to come in and try to get them to think differently than what God says. He will try to deceive them just like he did in the garden. Nothing new. And he's going to try to deceive men just like he did. It's different in the garden. He got us to rebel in the garden. But we struggle with that. If you jump back into chapter one, which we just talked about, about these quarreling and these bickering and these meaningless arguments that promote nothing. Who was he talking about? He was talking about men. Guys have issues. Girls have issues. We all have issues. What do we have in common? We all have issues. What's the solution? Jesus Christ. And I think it's so important that if we put Christ at the front of everything, somehow, some way, everything works itself out. I hope that made sense to you today. If not, Leave a comment in our comment section that doesn't exist. Love you. Bless you. Have a great day.